Bibles, you can open those up to the book of 1 Kings, 1 Kings tonight, and we're actually going to be looking at chapter 17 and 18, right? But we're going to kind of have a little bit of an introduction before we dive into the text. And if you're taking note tonight, we're going to, the question I'm asking, the title to the message, but the title to the series over the next couple weeks is, Could Revival Happen Again? Could Revival Happen Again? Again, and I ask you that, you know, I ask myself that. When the coronavirus thing first went down and as a church, we realized, oh my gosh, we're not going to be able to actually physically gather. Um, I've never known a time in my lifetime, none of us have, where the church of Jesus Christ was not able to gather. You know, there may have been a time in your life where you weren't yet saved and you didn't go to church. Maybe you're saved. You just started watching these and you never went to church regularly before the coronavirus. But listen, I think there's a real opportunity, there's a, uh, and you'll see this as we go through this series, that the revivals that happened in biblical times, the, Bible, the, the revivals that happened even in modern era, beginning with the founding of the United States of America, kind of the, we're going to talk about a little bit of that tonight, on to you know, more recent revivals like the Jesus movement, they happened in times of crisis. We're going to talk about, as we go through this series, the difference between a revival and an awakening. What, in the biblical model, what you're going to discover, we're going to look tonight in 1 Kings, but what you're going to discover as we go through this series, we look at these biblical models, and then we look at what happened in more modern times, what you're going to discover is pretty much the process and what happened in the heart of man, it's very consistent. It basically stays the same throughout the Bible on into modern history. So we're going to ask that question, could revival happen again? And we're going to look at this, the Bible um, occurrences of revival and awakening, and then we'll look at a few in our modern times. So our Bible should be open, 1 Kings chapter 17. I did a message many years ago called, we need a re-Bible, right? We need to get back into the word. And don't worry, that message is going to come back. I think it's number three in our series here um, as we look at King Josiah. But tonight we're going to look at Elijah, and we're going to see what revival looked like in that day. So hopefully your Bible is open. Hopefully there's a spirit of expectancy desiring to hear from God and learn his word and know him better tonight. And Father, tonight we do pray in the name of Jesus. Lord, that as we study your word, Lord, as we come before the scriptures, as we worship and pray, as we come to the communion table, Lord, even tonight as we're in our homes Father, maybe some of us had bad days. Lord, we pray in the name of Jesus that you would begin a revival in our heart tonight, Lord, if one has not already started. Lord, I believe in many of my brothers' and sisters' hearts, revival has already begun. And Lord, we pray as we go through this series, Lord, as we, and what does that mean? As we just look what your, what your word says about revival. As we desire, Holy Spirit, to hear from you, Lord, God, would you bring about a revival in our lives, in our church, at Calvary Chapel Grace Fellowship, Lord? We cannot be responsible with everyone else, but Lord, for us, Lord, as for me and my house, Lord, we pray for a revival, and may it begin, Lord Jesus, in us, and we ask it in Jesus' precious name, amen. So, could revival happen again? Um, You know, I don't know about you, But for whatever reason, and it happened recently, I think it was Sunday or Monday of this past, you know, earlier in the week, um, you know, I was sitting in my chair in my living room. I have a chair. That is true. I have a chair. It says my name on it. No one else is allowed to touch it. It has an electric fence around it. It's not true. But I was sitting in my chair and, you know, usually the, the, the remote control happens to end up in my hand, generally speaking. But every now and then, my wife or my children will get a chance to pick something they want to watch, and they wanted to watch uh, the the movie called Mary Poppins. And I don't know, how many guys have seen Mary Poppins at home? Yeah, raise your hands. Put your hand up high. A couple of hands here are like, I love that movie. A lot of the guys, it's kind of weird. But anyways, no, I'm just kidding. But, you know, you love it. And they turn on Mary Poppins and we're watching it. And, you know, I don't know what it is about Mary Poppins. I don't know what it is when they want to put on a movie or a show that I don't really want to watch. But for whatever reason, that music... I think it was the spoonful of sugar moment, you know, just really just, it was just making me feel so good. I just, you know, you start to sleep. You start to, 
I don't snore, but you know, whatever. You start to sleep. And the funny thing that happens, I don't know about you, if you fall asleep in your living room while you're watching a show or something like that, and one of my kids or, you know, said to me, you know, Dad, you're sleeping. And I, I don't know about you, but you wake up and you go, no, no, no. I'm sleeping. I'm sleeping. I don't know what it is about that. I don't know why we're so afraid to admit that we fell asleep, you know. You know, tonight, we're going to move into this, this, this series about could revival happen again. And I'll tell you right out of the gate, the first part that we need to realize is that if revival is going to happen again, we got to realize that we're right now pretty much as a church, we're sleeping. You know, in the Holy Spirit, he's stirring us. And I think the, you know, I think the coronavirus for the church was this opportunity for, for the God of the Bible to say to us, wake up, wake up, wake up. You fell asleep. It's action. There's something happening. There's a scene going down in the world around us. There's a need for Jesus Christ and for the gospel like never before. But you fell asleep and it's time to wake up. And I think we have a tendency to wake up and go, no, no, no I wasn't sleeping. But tonight we need to recognize we, we were sleeping. We were sleeping and, and it's time to wake up, right? It's time to wake up. Now listen, the church here in America needs to wake up like never before. Now, in biblical end times, for you guys that are familiar with Bible prophecy, you know, if you know, China is pretty much there in Bible prophecy. Most scholars would agree with that. Israel is obviously there in Bible prophecy. Uh, Russia, Russia is there, Ezekiel 37 and 38. Iran, Persia is there. But really, when you study Bible prophecy, there's no reference to the United States of America. You know, we don't really see America in Bible prophecy. And there's a lot of reasons why that could be. You know, the Bible says, if you're taking note, jot it down, Proverbs 14, verse 34. It says, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. You know, here in the United States of America, there's an opportunity for revival. And it could be the reason why the United States is not there in the book of Revelation. It could be because we experience a, 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 a revival and millions of believers get saved, and at the rapture of the church, millions are taken to be with the Lord. And listen, you wipe out, you know, majority of the United States population, and we're no longer a world power. You know, I'm praying that's the reason why. Now, we don't know, but I do believe there is a possibility for revival. Now, I want to ask you a couple questions as we move into this text tonight in this series. You know, the first one is, and I want you to ask yourself this, truly, can we have a revival in our time? Like, could it happen? Like, do you think there could be a revival? There could be a revival. There could be an awakening of God's people. Can we see the Spirit of God revive the church again and it result in an awakening in our community, our cities, our states, and our nations? Now listen, as we go through this series, we're going to see revival in the Bible, right? Way to remember it. We're going to see revival in the Bible. Understand Whatever you see happening here, God by his spirit wants to work it through you and I, and he wants it to happen here, right? He wants it to happen in our time, in our world. And tonight, we're going to look at Elijah. Next Wednesday, we're going to look at King Asa. And this is so you can read ahead if you want to study ahead and think, all right, where's Pastor Bill going to go with this revival? King Asa next week, King Solomon the following week, King Josiah the, the following, the fifth time, fifth study, we'll look at Jonah. And then the last one, we're going to look at the four great awakenings that took place in the United States. And we're going to see what happened behind that. Now, tonight we're looking at 1 Kings chapter 17. And we're going to see um, this man, Elijah. Elijah. Now, a couple things, if you're taking note, as we look at Elijah, just because I don't want you to miss this man and who he was and what made him unique but I want you to realize Elijah was a prophet of God. And one of the things that really marked Elijah's life, if you're taking note, jot it down, was his consistency. Elijah was consistent. consistent. Elijah in a king's court was the same man that he was when he was all alone. That was Elijah. Elijah was not really a particular respecter of persons, but he was a man that was very bold. You're going to see it in the text here tonight. 
And this is really what we're going to study tonight. There's going to be a revival in Israel that God is going to rot through primarily this man, Elijah. Uh, there was other prophets in that time, but Elijah had the move of the Spirit. And you're going to see the challenges that come with being a part of, of a legitimate biblical revival. So, if your Bibles are open, 1 Kings chapter 17. Tonight we're going to pick it up, verse 1. It says, And Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, if you have your pen, circle that name Ahab. Uh, previously, in verses uh, chapter 16, verse 29 through, through 34, we see there, you know, Ahab was a wicked man. And if you want to know who, wick, who Ahab was, just write down Mr. Wicked, okay? This guy was bad. Uh, everything you could think of, chapter 16, look back a couple verses in your Bible, verse 30. Now Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. Ahab was the most wicked of all of the kings, but that wasn't all. Uh, it's verse 31, and it came to pass as though, look at this, when the Holy Spirit says this in the Bible, it's true, as though it had been a trivial thing for, her to, for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the sin of Nabat, that he took as wife Jezebel. So that's Mrs. Wicked. You know, that's really their names, Mr. and Mrs. Wicked. Took his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Etbal, king of the Sidonians, and he went and served Baal and worshiped him. I mean, this guy was, was bad. It was a trivial thing for him to do wicked, abominable things in God's eyes. Back to chapter 17, Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, so right out of the gate, you see Elijah coming out swinging. He goes right up to Mr. Wicked. And he says, as the Lord God of Israel lives, look at that, verse one, before whom I stand, he says, there shall not be dew nor rain these three years except at my word. Elijah said, there is going to be a drought in Israel until I say it's not going to be a drought, Mr. Wicked. Verse two, then the word of the Lord came to him saying, get away from here and turn eastward and hide by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. Now this is kind of interesting. He's got boldness. He goes, stands in front of Ahab. He's so bold. He says, there's going to be a drought in Israel until I say so. And in order to get Elijah away and to literally protect him, the Holy Spirit has to tell him, run, <laughs> like run. Like Ahab wasn't a fake wicked man, right? He wasn't a poser. He wasn't faking his wickedness. Ahab was wicked. Ahab would kill Elijah if he could. He would. And God has to now tell Ahab to run and go hide by the brook Cherith. Look what happens, verse four. And it will be that you shall drink from the brook and I have commanded the ravens there to feed you there. The miracles happening. Look at this. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. If you have your pen, underline that. He went and did according to the word of the Lord. He didn't take matters in his own hands. He didn't do what was right in his own eyes. He did what the word of the Lord said. For he went and stayed by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. Verse six, look at this. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning. See this in your mind's eyes. Elijah obeys God. He goes and hides by this brook. He's going, man, I'm really hungry. And all of a sudden you see this big black bird, this raven come flying over. <laughs> it brings him bread and meat in the morning. I mean, the miracle is that the bird brought it, and the miracle is the bird didn't eat it on his way to bringing it to him, you know? So in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening. So he got a morning meal and an evening meal, you know, by bird mail there, you know? They brought it to him, and he drank from the book, interest, uh, the brook. So the food was brought to him, but he had to go to the river himself and drink from it, notice. Verse 7, and it happened after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain, in the land. Now, this is interesting. Elijah here confronts Mr. and Mrs. Wicked with the word of the Lord. Ravens now, he has to run and find safety. Ravens come and bring him food to drink, I mean, food to eat in the morning and the evening. But notice, as I said in the text, he's got to go down and he's got to get the water for himself. You know, when it comes to a revival, we're going to have to walk by faith. We have to obey the Lord. We have to hear the word of the Lord, like we see with Elijah. But what's interesting, when you're really walking with the Lord and there's a personal revival happening inside of you, there are times when God does miracles and there are times when God says, I want you to go and get some water for yourself, you know. And, and it's very important that we walk with the Lord because one thing the God of the Bible never does is just, is no cookie cutter. There's no program. 
He never lets you put wires together and just get to the point where Jesus is automated, right? You just click a button and all of a sudden you forced to read your Bible and pray. No, man, you're always got to be engaged. Elijah had to hear from the Lord. You know, he had to stay close to the Lord. But it's interesting that it says there in the text, it happened after a while that the brook dried up. You know, Elijah probably got there. He's getting the food. He obeyed the Lord. He's going, this is kind of weird. But then all of a sudden, the brook dries up. And, and, you know, Elijah must have said, what next? What am I supposed to do? You know, is it over, Lord? Is that it? That's all you had for me? You know, at this point, I wonder if Elijah, right there at the beginning, he's not even close to revival yet. He was just beginning. I see this in believers' life. They're just getting started. They're just learning how to walk with the Lord. They finally go, oh, my gosh. I did a Bible verse, right? You see this. A Christian tells one person about Jesus, one person. And all of a sudden they're like, yeah, pastor, I would like to do an evangelism training course at the church. It's like, okay, let's calm down now. You know what I mean? The best of the Christians that are telling everybody about Jesus are like, I'm just not good enough. You know, pray for me. No, no, no. You ask, you know, maybe you want to join the custodial team. No, I'm not worthy. It's like, you, you love it. And that's kind of Elijah. You know, the, the, the situation, the, the, the river runs dry. What's he supposed to do next? Is he going to just get discouraged and give up? Look what happens. Verse 8. It says, Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. Now, I love this. This is part of Elijah's training. And this is also, as God is training Elijah, he's also going to use Elijah to bless this widow and to teach her more about the Lord. Now, listen, if you're taking note, it's number one in terms of, um, just in terms of revival and what does that look like? What does revival look like? Number one, revival looks like waiting on the word of the Lord. Revival looks like you and I learning how to wait on the word of the Lord, to wait on God, to really wait on him. You know, I think many, and we're going to see this in the text later on, I think, you know, often what we look at today as Christianity isn't really backed up by scripture, right? Elijah here, this bold prophet, you know, in his natural man, Elijah was not a pushover. And some would obviously miss later on. You're going to see this with Ahab. They're going to misunderstand because Elijah is a man of God and he waits on God. They're going to misunderstand that and they'll be taught that lesson. But notice here, Elijah waits on the word of the Lord. He waits. He waits. And as he waits, God speaks to him but sends him to this widow. You know, this, if there was ever a chance for Elijah to talk back and say, what are you talking about, Lord? You're sending me to where? A widow? what? It's crazy. God, I got a much better idea. He does it. He waits on the word of the Lord and he does what the word of God says, what the word of God says. Let's move on. Verse 10, it says, so he arose, went to Zarephath, and interestingly enough, and when he came to the gate of the city, indeed a, wid indeed a widow was there gathering sticks, right? And he called to her, look at Elijah, Mr. Bold, and he said, please bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink. Elijah doesn't even do like the introductions. You know, he doesn't say, hi, my name's Elijah. I was sent by God. I've already confronted Ahab. He told me you were going to be here. Elijah just comes right out with it. And he goes, listen, bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink. Verse 11, and as she was going to get it, he called her and said, also, you know what? Please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. He's like, I'd like a little pastry, you know. Give me some water or pastry. Now you're going, what's the big deal? That's just hospi hospitable. Look at the big deal. Verse 12. So she said, as the Lord your God lives, she said, I do not have bread. Only a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar. And see, I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it. And if you have your pen, underline this and die. You know, God is sending Elijah to this woman because our God has wonderful, wonderful plans. You know, one of the scariest things as a pastor and as a Christian who've walked with the Lord and to be honest, you know, desires to see revival, not just in the church, but I want to see revival in myself. I want to daily live with the life of Jesus flowing through me 
is I often see man and Christians and even sometimes encouragement through the, through the churches and preaching of like almost planning your life, you know. I remember back, back in the day before I moved to, to New York and, you know, I was still single. And I remember one of the brothers, we were talking and, you know, he was like, you know, when you're single, and the married people forget this, but the single people know what I'm talking about. When you're single, you kind of sometimes find yourself thinking about what you'd want in the other person and things like this. And I remember one guy, he had this list, you know, of all the things he wanted in this woman. Now, listen, if you know me, I relate more with like an Elijah than I do with like a John the Apostle or, you know, a Timothy. I'm not like that. And I'll never forget, he showed me this list of all these wonderful qualities in this woman he wanted to marry. And I was like, you want that woman to marry you? You know, it's like, I mean, do you, are you any of these qualities? You know, like even one of them other than Christian, you know, other than that, you know, it was a, it was a funny moment. He laughed for a little while, then he realized I was serious and he stopped laughing. But, uh, you know, it's interesting. You know, Elijah here, God sends, God sends Elijah and Elijah is in a desperate place, but there's a difference for Elijah. See, Elijah knows the God of the Bible. He knows it's, it's all good, man. You can't fail with Jesus, right? But this woman doesn't yet know this, but God sends Elijah to her on purpose. And what he tells her is just shocking. You know, he says, I want you to, make, to bring me water and make me a meal with the last morsels. This woman is getting ready to make a meal for her son and herself so they can eat it. That's the rest of their, 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 their food. Then they're going to die. And you think, wow, this Elijah, he's really selfish. You know, Elijah stopped living for himself long before he met this widow. Okay. He didn't confront Ahab because he was living for himself. He didn't listen to the word of the Lord and go by the brook to be fed by ravens because he was living for himself. He knew God. He was obeying the Lord. There was a reason behind this. You see, God was going to teach this widow something in the midst of God's grand plan, in the midst of God's desire to see revival in this day. In order for God to bring about revival, he actually has to bring us with him. And maybe you're taking notes, jot this down. Listen, without God, we can't. But without us, he won't. God will not bring about revival without the church. He just won't do it. If God's people don't want it, he's not going to do it. You know, and here God is beginning, and look who God uses. Look who God sends the prophet to. It wasn't then God sent Elijah to the great senator, and he had so much authority. No, he sends Elijah, he sends Elijah to a, no, to a widow, somebody who was a nobody in the culture. But to God, she was, she was precious. He was going to use his most, his most powerful resource in that day to minister to her. You know, one thing he wanted to teach her was faith. If you're taking note, Matthew 6, 33, it's there Jesus says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You know, I could say this. If, if, if you don't catch this, you know, God in the Old Testament, and Jesus solidifies this in the New Testament, the best and the first belongs to God. That's what, the, that's what the word of God says. I know people, they want to do all these extraordinary things for God and use like big Christian words, but they're not willing to start with the basics of the, of the word of God. Like the first and best of our life, according to scripture, belongs to him. And that's not revival Christianity. That's just basic Christianity. That's where Jesus starts with. That's the, that's the entry level with Jesus. You know, that's how we realize, man, this is who you are. This is how good you are. And, and God here does this even in the widow's precarious situation. Let's read on verse 13. And Elijah said to her, do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake <laughs> from it first and bring it to me. Elijah doesn't say, talk to me about your predicament. How, how, how scared are you right now? You and your son are going to die. He says, go do this first. You know, go make me cake. And afterward, make some for yourself and your son. He's like, after you bring me my cake, you go ahead and get some too, right? Verse 14, for thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. Verse 15, so she went away and did according to the word of Elijah. She and he and her household ate for many days. Verse 16, look at this. If you have your pen, underline it. 
the bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Elijah. God fulfilled his promise. Elijah knew this in advance. The, the ones that are reading this going, man, this Elijah is really selfish and self-centered. No, he's not. He was being used of God to bring this woman into the deeper things of God. And this is a challenge of making disciples. You know, in a season like this, there are challenges, right? Because if you know God and you know him, you know there's really nothing to be afraid of right now. I know God. All my days are written in his book. He, he's the one who commands the heavens and the earth. You know, we're afraid of coronavirus. God can't handle this. God actually keeps the earth rotating around the sun and all the planetary systems and all the stars in place. He, he can protect you. He's, he's been protecting you from bigger things than this your entire life. This is not big to him. That's Elijah. He knows God. He walks in that. But the widow yet doesn't know God like this. But boy, oh boy, is she about to. Watch what happens next. Verse 17. Now it happened after these things, look at this, that the son of the woman who owned the house became sick. So she was blessed materially, but now all of a sudden something deeper to her heart is tested. Her son becomes sick and his sickness was so serious that there was no breath left in him, meaning he dies. So she said to Elijah, what have I to do with you, O man of God? Have you come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to kill my son? <laughs> this is tough stuff, man. Listen, if you want to see revival happen in your life, if you want to be a man or a woman of God, number two, you got to learn to stay the course for God's goodness. You got to stay the course. No matter what happens around you, no matter what happens in people's lives, you have to continue to realize who God is and that at the end of the day, the God of the Bible is good. He is good. Now listen, this woman gets very mad at God. <laughs> you go, no, you're misreading it. She wasn't mad at God. She was mad at Elijah. Are you kidding me? Who's Elijah? Elijah's nothing. Elijah, none of these things. Elijah was like, and then... You know, he's not a little boy writing in his journal going, one day I want to confront Ahab and tell him he's a sinner. And then I want to go to a river and have birds bring me my meals. And then that never happened. All Elijah was was a man that had surrendered his life to the Lord. He was having personal revival. And now God was going to bring that about. He was yielded to God. And this woman now was not mad at Elijah. She was mad at God. And you know why it looks like she was mad at Elijah? Because God... Because Elijah was God's representative. You know, anytime you represent God, people will get mad at you. <laughs> anytime. Not everybody. But anytime you represent God, people will get mad at you. If they are being rebellious against God, guess what's going to happen? They're going to rebel against you. That's just what happens. If you're taking a note, jot it down. John 15, verse 20. Jesus tells us, he goes, listen, you know, you're my servants, they're, they're going to treat you like they treated me, the master. If you follow me, that's how they're going to treat you. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, it says, All those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will get a new Rolls Royce. That's what the Bible says. That's not what it says. 2 Timothy 3, 12 says, All those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, right? There are Christians that want to live in sinful behaviors, and you don't even have to confront them. But they will persecute you because you say, God bless you, but no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna act that way. I'm not gonna get in a screaming match with you. You know, if you throw mud at me, I'm not gonna throw mud back at you. I'm gonna pray for you. God bless you. I love you. We're part of the same family. I let dad handle it type of thing. And Elijah did that. And boy, listen, people will vent their anger at God, at you. But you need to be able to stay the course regardless of that. You need to not be able to, to let that get you on a rabbit trail because it could throw you off if you're not careful. Let's move on, verse 19. And what did Elijah say to her? He said to her, verse 19, give me your son. <laughs> Elijah didn't say, get out of here. 
Did you have an appointment? You know, Elijah didn't say, who do you think you are? I'm the guy that got you the cake after you gave me the cake. He didn't say that. What did he say? He said, give me your son. So he took him out of her arms, carried him to the upper room where he was staying, and laid him on his own bed. He lays him on his own bed. Elijah right now, listen, is in a tight spot. I'm a pastor. I, I share the gospel. I have been in places similar to this. Where, man, people are genuinely mad at God. They're questioning the, the plans of God. They're questioning the goodness of God. And as a representative for God, you are in a tight spot because you are God's servant. You know what's interesting about a servant? You don't have the authority to just say stuff. You can't just say, well, you know what? The angels up there, and he's an angel now in the cloud. You can't say that because you know the Bible, and you're held to accountability, and you're not your own. You're his servant. That's what a revival looks like. It looks like people getting in line with God. You know, and I, I was thinking about this as I was studying, you know, because this does happen to us. If you represent God, I'm sure this is happening to you. But what's interesting is if you go to a restaurant, which you probably haven't been in about three months now, right? But if you go to a restaurant, when you went to restaurants back in the day, many years ago, when you went to the restaurant, if you sit down to eat and all of a sudden you look at your food and there's like a, there's like a cockroach in your food, it's gross, right? Or there's like a big long hair. You ever got that? You go, you're, especially if you're eating spaghetti. And then you're like, that's not a piece of spaghetti, you know? It, what happens? You know, we, what do we do? We look at the waiter, the waitress, we're like, what is wrong with this place? This is disgusting. Meanwhile, all that guy did was take the food and bring it and put it on the table. He didn't make it. He didn't cook it. He didn't put it on the plate. But we get mad at him. He's probably looking going, listen, man, I've been telling the chef to put it, but he can't say that. We don't go into the, to the, to the kitchen. Because, I want to speak to the chef. You know, that's kind of the position Elijah's in here. You know, Elijah has to stand for the goodness of God, but there's some confusion, I'm sure, in Elijah's life at this very moment. But look what happens next, verse 20. Then he cried out to the Lord, and look what he said, and said, O Lord my God, have you also brought tragedy on the widow with whom I lodge by killing her son? So to the woman, he says, God is good, give me your son. He gets in God's presence, and now he goes, Lord, what in the world are you doing? Right? That's what we do. do you ever heard the phrase, complain up? You know, that's used in military operations, things like that. But can I say as Christians, especially in this season, we should be bringing our complaints to the king. It's very dangerous. You know, I know many believers, they, they, they make this error. And they, they find friendship in people that are not yet even saved. And then they share all their frustrations of life and they complain to these unsaved people. And we, we call them our friends, not realizing your job in their life is to, is to one day bring them into the kingdom of God. And they're listening to you going, man, I think I'm more content than this Christian. It's a mistake. Look what Elisha does here. He brings it to the Lord. He says, Lord, my God, have you also brought tragedy on the widow with whom I lodge by killing her son? Elijah didn't understand it either. But he knew God, and he knew he could go right to God and cry out to him. Verse 21, and he stretched himself out on the child three times. Elijah just laid out on this dead boy's body three times and cried out to the Lord and said, Oh, Lord, my God, I pray, let this child's soul come back to him. Verse 22, then the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came back to him. And look at this, and he revived him. Now listen, in this chapter with Elijah, we see God revive one boy. One boy. One boy. And I want to just take a moment here, and I want you to notice something. As Elijah represents God's goodness in public, in private, he was honest before God. You know, as the church, I think we need to get honest before God. What's shocking in our land today is just how little we see of what's actually going on. You, know, you have men and women, and I say this lovingly, and please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying the coronavirus is not a legitimate thing. But you got men and women petrified, scared to the core of their bones about catching the coronavirus. And we have teenagers all across this country that don't want to live so badly they're killing themselves but we're scared of the corona. It's crazy. We've got abortion 
as an essential in this country right now. Essential. We've got people saying it's a woman's right to kill a, for, their, for the women's own sake. We should tell them it's not a good idea. To kill a, a living being inside of them. Many people arguing we should be able to do that till the last seconds of life. Coronavirus should be the least of our worries. <laughs> it's the least. But as the church, we have to get real with God. We got to go before the Lord and say, Lord, you know, we've missed this. We're not crying out to you for this like we should. But this little boy is revived. Now, listen, I want to take a moment. I wanted to, to and we're going to, I'm going to share this with you over the course of the series of these teachings. That, you know, I hear, I hear people even in our church, we pray for revival. Many of you guys are wonderful. You pray for revival. And some of you guys pray for an awakening and a revival. Lord, I pray for an awakening revival, a revival awakening. I, I kind of want to define this for you. So God's like, I want to give you what you're asking, but you keep asking for different things. I want to <laughs> explain to you what this is. Listen, this is what revival is. Revival is a church word. God cannot revive unsaved people. Revival is to come alive again. You cannot be revived if you are not born again, right? If you're, not, if you're listening to this message today and you're not yet saved, you need to receive Jesus for the first time. You need to see Jesus as Lord and Savior, as the one who died for your sins, and you need to receive him. But revival is for the church. Revival is, is, is the church wakes up from a place of sleep, right? That's revival. Now, what happens is when the church revives, according to, to biblical history, and according to even modern history, when the church revives, an awakening takes place. Because when the church becomes what God intended the church to be, people start getting saved, man. The nation just changes. That's how it works. You know, I see this and I'm not against, you know, you protest, it's in our constitution. But I'll tell you right now, the greatest way to bring transformation is for the church of Jesus Christ to turn back to Jesus and cry out to him. Revival happens in the church and the result of a revival in the church is awakening. It's millions of people coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I ask you, could revival happen again? Could revival happen again? Here we see this boy revived. Now we gotta move on here. It says, and Elijah took the child, brought him down from the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, see, your son lives. Man, that must have been a great moment for Elijah. This woman's like, yeah, no, I don't. all right. Brings the boy alive. She's like, oh, I love you, you know. It's amazing. Verse 24, then the woman said to Elijah, now by this I know that you are a man of God. That was what it told her. And that the word of the Lord in your mouth is, tr is the truth. So God revives a boy, but look what happens next, chapter 18, verse 1. And it came to pass, it says, after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year saying, go present yourself to Ahab and I will send rain on the earth. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab and there was a severe famine in Samaria, verse 3. And Ahab had called Obadiah who was in charge of his house. Now look at this. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. For so it was while Jezebel massacred the prophets of the Lord <laughs> that Obadiah had taken 100 prophets and hidden them, 50 to a cave, and have fed them with bread and water. Now, I love this. Number three, if you're taking note in terms of revival, number three is revival truly is a contest between the f forces of good and evil. That's what revival is. You know, I believe in the sovereignty of God. I do. I believe the Bible teaches the sovereignty of God. But I also believe that God does work with man. I do. I think we see it in Scripture. And, and here what we see is there are real forces of evil, and God has raised up Elijah to raise a standard against him. And even amongst God's people, there was a different measure to who had their finger on the pulse of what God was doing. You know, we have Elijah the prophet challenging Ahab. You see here, if you're, if you're taking note, oh, you can underline it there in verse four. Jezebel was massacring the prophets of the Lord. You know, in the book of Revelation later on, Revelation 2.20, to the church of Thyatira, Jesus will bring rebuke to the pastor of the church of Thyatira because he's allowed this woman Jezebel, whether that was her real name, it really was more of a, an idea. It's a, Jezebel was a woman who told everyone that she was a prophet. 
You know, whenever a prophet has to tell you they're a prophet, that's usually not a good thing, right? You know how you know a prophet? Because they're getting murdered, right? They're, real prophets are always getting attacked by other people. And they usually don't want to tell anybody they're a prophet because they don't want any more punches, right? They're just trying to serve Jesus. But Jezebel wanted to have this position and this power, and she had kind of anointed herself as a prophet. You see it here, but we see it in Revelation as well. And, and to the church in Revelation, you know, and sometimes people don't understand this, to the pastor of the church in Thyatira, Jesus says, if you don't deal with this, this Jezebel spirit, this, this spirit of wanting to have this power and this anointing that you've given yourself, it, 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 I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave your church, Jesus said to the pastor. She'll be there, but I won't. And he had to deal with that. And we see that beginning here in, in uh, 1 Kings chapter 18. Jezebel was massacring the prophets of the Lord. Massacring them. You know, she was actually killing them. You know, she was murdering them. She was using the Israeli soldiers to go around and kill all of God's prophets. But that same spirit happens today. And it, it, the way they're, the prophets of God, those that actually speak for God, are massacred by this Jezebel spirit is through the mouth, right? It's through slander and gossip. You see it in Timothy. Paul says the, the busybodies, the ones that go from house to house, text to text, right? Like, you got to be careful with that. You know, most, most godly women don't have enough time to do all that because they're with Jesus. They're reading their Bibles. They love their husbands. You know, if they're single, they're serving the Lord. They're not here to sit here and, you know, tell, well, you know what I saw her do the other day, right? What I know about him is, blah, 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 right? God is not pleased with that. He's just not. And we see here, Jezebel was massacring the prophets of God. Also, if you have your pen, circle that Obadiah. He was a prophet of God, but he was actually working for Ahab and Jezebel. It's very interesting. Very interesting. You know, we can have brothers and sisters who love Jesus and are Christians, but for whatever reason, right or wrong, maybe it's just where God placed them. They're not seeing the severity of the season we're in. And I would say, you know, Elijah's posture towards Ahab was a little different than Obadiah's. Obadiah was, Eli was Ahab's servant, and Ahab wanted to kill Elijah. A little different. But that's, revival doesn't have to happen in everyone's life. It's up to you. You want to get in line with what God wants to do. Because it truly is a contest between the forces of good and the forces of evil. Don't misunderstand that. Verse 17 um, we're going to kind of skip some verses here. There's some go between. Ahab is looking for Elijah, but look what happens. Verse, uh, verse, actually, look at verse 16. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. Verse 17, then it happened when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said to him, and listen, if you, in your mind's eye, want to know what this situation looked like, if you've ever watched a boxing match before the initial bell was rung when the guys are just looking at each other, that was Ahab and Elisha, right? Ahab's been looking for, Ahab's no slouch either. He was Mr. Wicked, right? He wasn't faking it. And Elisha was a man who knew God, right? It says, then it happened when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said to him, is that you, O troubler of Israel? So Ahab sees him and goes, the problems in Israel are your fault. Listen, people that are in sin, that are, you know, Ahab was a, was, a, was a king of Israel. He was supposed to be a godly king. He had a, a, a name that he was a Christian, but his lifestyle was wicked. They always love to blame other people for the problems they have. And that's what we see here. <laughs> Ahab saw Elijah and he says to him, is that you, O troubler of Israel? And look at what Elijah says, verse 18. And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have. And that you have forsaken, if you ever pen, circle this, you've forsaken the commandments of the Lord and have followed, circle followed, the Baals. So with your actions, you've turned away from the things of God, and with your heart, you've fallen in love with the things of this world. He says, that's you, bud. You're the problem, Ahab. <laughs> Okay, Elijah, you're asking for it. Verse 19, now therefore send and gather all Israel to me on Mount Carmel, the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. Elijah says, let's go. This is a contest 
between good and evil. And we're about to find out who's on the side of good and who's on the side of evil. You know, sometimes I think we think that the great enemies of God, it's very obvious. Like it's like the Bible versus witchcraft. No, please. How many times was Jesus approached with witches in the Bible? <laughs> with people who worshiped the law? That was never the problem. Satan closed himself as an angel of light. I think one of the greatest obstacles to revival in America is the Pharisees and the Sadducees, is, is, the, though, is the terrors, those that, that we look at and we say, that's a Christian, and yet they don't live like Jesus, the Christian, and read their Bibles, husbands who don't love their wives, right? You know, it's interesting, a poll of America, if you, if you ask Americans how many Americans are saved, they've done these polls, you know how many often say they're born-again Christians? About 50% of the United States of America. If you believe 50% of the United States of America is born again, listen, I got this island I want to sell you. Just send us an email here to the church. 50% of Americans are not Christians. It's not true. But, that's, but, but they don't understand. Listen, if a you know, good tree is known by its fruit. And Ahab here, there's this contest. There's this reality. Look what happens here, verse 20. So Ahab sent for all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together on Mount Carmel. And Elijah came to all the people and said, how long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people answered him not a word. It's very sad. Elijah said, it's time to make a decision. You know, too many of us here in the United States of America think it's enough. Well, I like Jesus and I believe in Jesus. But I also, you know, I just want to hedge my bets. I also believe in you know, I want to trust in the world. and I want to do these things. And, you know, sin's not so bad. Come on, it's not so bad to do this and that. And Elijah said, it's time to make a decision, right? And he calls them out, but the people answered him not a word. Listen, when God answers, asks you a question, don't remain silent. You know, that's a, that's a belligerent, prideful posture. It's the wrong posture. Answer, even if it's the wrong answer, answer, answer. Verse 22, then Elisha said to the people, he said, I guess I alone am left the prophet of the Lord. But Elijah wasn't discouraged. He wasn't like, oh man, all of Israel is not with me. Elijah didn't care. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. He goes, watch this. It's one, verse 450. Verse 23, therefore, let them give us two bowls. Let them choose one bowl for themselves, cut it in pieces, lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it. And I will prepare the other bowl and lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it. Verse 24, then you call on the name of your gods and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God, listen, who answers by fire, he is God, right? Elijah was interested in showing the children of Israel, showing the prophets of Baal, showing Ahab and Jezebel that the true and living God was the actually only true God. That the rest of these gods that man had made in their own images when the, when the stuff hit the fan, when the crisis happened, they were impotent to do anything about it. There was no peace. There was no love. There was no power. But Elijah knew his God. He knew it. It says, so all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. Verse 25, now Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one bowl for yourselves and prepare it first, for you are many. And call in the name of your God, but put no fire under it, he said. So they took the bowl which was given them, and they prepared it and called on the name of Baal from morning even till noon. I mean, we're talking five in the morning. We're talking seven hours just, just seeking their God. You know, it, it, I can't help but, but see the difference here and see kind of what we think of as revival today in our modern Christian culture and see it in the context of this, this chapter. And they called for a long time they were there, right? And from, from morning until noon, saying, Oh, Baal, hear us. But there was no voice. No one answered. Then they leaped about the altar which they had made. So these guys were really into it. They're leaping about, right? And so it was at noon that Elijah began to mock them, right? Elijah was like this and said, Cry aloud, you know, for he is God, either maybe he's meditating. Maybe your God is praying to another God, right? Or he is busy right now, right? Maybe he's in another part of the world. He's not here. Or he's on a journey. He might be needing a little vacation. You guys look a little difficult, you know. Maybe he needed to seek some vacation, some R&R, &R, right? 
or perhaps he is sleeping and you got to wake him up. Verse 21, so they cried aloud and it began to cut themselves, right? As was their custom with knives and lances until the blood gushed out of them. The idea was their God wouldn't respond until they really sacrificed until they really gave up everything. You know, this past Sunday, we looked at the scripture where Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. You know, and we get these ideas. Even the woman previously, the widow, she, she got mad at Elijah. She was mad at God and she said, are you gonna bring up my sins? This is because of some sin I did in my past. And it was probably a sin in her mind's eye that she had committed at some point. She thought, this is why she was suffering now. Can I say, that's just bad doctrine. That's just not how the God of the Bible works. It's not what he does. You and I, to get the God of the Bible's attention, don't have to cut ourselves and jump around and pray for seven hours and let him know, you don't know how serious I am about you. In that moment, he finally says, all right, I'll listen for five minutes and that's it. It's not the God of the Bible. It's not Jesus. You know, that's how the enemy would want us to think he is, but that's not who he is. That's how they thought. And they did this. They leapt around. Elijah mocks them. They begin to cut themselves, verse 29. And when midday was past, they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. It's interesting how even false prophets can prophesy. They can sound very spiritual. They can say, thus saith Baal. And this he says, and they have all the movements. But look at this. But there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. You know, Elijah taunts them. He calls them out on their silliness, you know. And they did it all. They made it look like something was happening. But listen, nothing actually happened. The God of the Bible did not move. And their false gods were impotent to move. They had no power. Verse 30, we're almost done. It says, then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. So all the people came near to him and he repaired the altar of the Lord. Elijah goes, and he goes to the altar where they were supposed to be worshiping on Mount Carmel. And it's broken down. It was obvious. It'd be like if I came to your house and you were going through trouble. And you're like, yeah, it's because of this. It's because of that. And, you know, the dog and my wife and my daughter and the Nintendo and the television. And then the internet was slow. I was trying to watch my shows. And I says, do you have a Bible? And you're like, oh, yeah. And you started looking for it. And I pulled it off. And it was like deep, 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 deep back in your bookshelf, you know? And I pulled it out and I said, <laughs> and I went to open, it was like, right? And I, oh my God. It's like Elijah. He went back to the place where they should have been the whole time. And it says now, he repairs, he repairs the altar. So Elijah said to the people, come near me. So all the people came near. He repaired the altar of the Lord, verse 30, that was broken down. Verse 31, Elijah took 12 stones. This is the 12 tribes of Israel. He's bringing them back to their identity. He goes, you're worshiping Ashtoreth and Baal. You're Jewish people. God delivered your ancestors from slavery in Egypt and you've walked through the Red Sea on dry ground. You are the tribe of Israel. He says, you're a child of God. Why are you living in sin? Come back. According to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name, verse 32. Then with the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord. He made a trench around the altar, large enough to hold two sayers of seed. And he put the wood in order, cut the bull in pieces, laid it on the wood and said, fill four water parts with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. Why would he fill it with water? Because water does not burn. <laughs> he wanted to show this is a miracle. God's about to move. Then he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. So the water ran all around the altar. And he also filled the trench with water. It's like you go to make a fire, you put the sticks in, and then you go and you get vats of water and you just pour it on the sticks. And the sticks are drenched. You can't light that. You need dry wood. So the water ran all around the altar. He also filled the trench with water. Verse 36, and it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, look at this, that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts 
back to you again. Number four, if you're taking note, in terms of could revival happen again, and we're learning it from Elijah, number four, is know that God will come through. You got to put yourself in a position where you know God will come through, man. He will see you through. He will move on your behalf. And you see Elijah now begin to pray to the Lord. Verse 38, then the fire of the Lord fell, consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust. And it licked up the water that was in the trench. Now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And look, what does Elijah say? Elijah says, seize the prophets of Baal. He says, seize these false prophets. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and executed them there. You know, wow, what an ending. Why? He had to deal with these false prophets, these false gods, these false gods. And it's our last point this evening, number five, if you're taking note. If you want to see revival, you have to learn to pray according to God's will. You know, I know God's people love to pray, and that's a good thing. I know some of you love to pray, and that's a good thing. But prayer that is just filled with our own ideas and our own vision and our own plans, it's not powerful prayer. You know, one, one uh, old man of God once said, he says, the best prayers are the people who study the Bible the most. <laughs> it's the people who know God's word. If you noticed in, in Elijah's prayer there, he prayed what God had already promised him. What God's word had already said, he prayed it. He said, Lord, you send, as you said, you sent me here. You're the one doing this. I'm your servant. He didn't cut his arms like they did. He didn't jump around and leap on the altar. He prayed. You see him pouring the water on the altar. Water in the, script, in the Bible is a symbol of the word of God. He drenched it with water. And then he asked for the fire, you know. Listen, could revival happen again? I'm going to invite uh, um, the worship team up. We're going to close here in a